In this video, you're going to be able to hear these records. They're very unique. They're very different. Some of them may be the only copies of this exact recording in all of existence. So sit back, let's have some fun, and let's enjoy some audio recordings. everybody and welcome back to another video here on my channel. We're going to be doing something very fun today and something that's quite different for my channel. Um, about two years ago I did make some videos about these sort of recordio discs, these sort of cardboard records. Uh, so when we get to that section of the video, if you like that sort of content, you want to hear and learn more about those records, you can go back on my channel and find those videos if you wish. But today we're going to be going through these sort of different vinyl records that I had just sort of sitting around my house for the last few years and I decided kind of on a whim that I was just going to take them, record them, and using my audio skills, I am an audio engineer who I got my degree in audio engineering back in 2007. I've been working in the audio industry uh, since then, sort of off and on doing different things, working at a recording studio, a professional recording studio for seven years. Um, I've been editing lots of podcasts, making music, editing up bands, doing all sorts of things, commercials, whatever. But one of my absolute favorite things that I used to do at the recording studio that I used to work at was uh, audio restoration projects. So sometimes people would bring us in a cassette tape. Sometimes people would bring in a record. That was pretty rare, but sometimes someone would bring in a record that was some sort of a family recording or something that they had. And uh, on occasion, we worked with tape, like magnetic tape. And I really loved those projects because it feels like you're reaching into the past and you're bringing something up into the present. And in a lot of cases with a lot of this stuff, these are probably the only recordings uh, of this, like these are the only copies of these recordings in existence. And so it helps, it makes me feel like a historian. It makes me feel like I'm doing something worthwhile to take these discs and to, uh, you know, digitize them. And so what this video is going to be, and I want to let you know right away, uh, if you don't want to listen to me talk, there will be different in the in the description of this video, you will notice timestamps for all the different sections. And so what I'll do is if you want, you can just hover over the time, uh, the timestamp or the timeline, hover over the timeline of the video. And you'll see like, I'll clearly have every section labeled as to what's happening, what's playing and what's going on. So you can skip around the video and find the, the thing you're looking for. But uh, yeah, so I just want to say this is a fun project for me. And I, like I said, not something I was really planning on doing at this moment, but I'm really glad that I did it. So um, I think the best way to do this is to just go through each of these one at a time. And then what I'll do is I'll explain kind of what it is, show it. I'll use a separate camera uh, that may or may not look as good as the quality of this video. And I'll try to film the records all up close, flip them around so you can see the different details on the record. And then what I'll do is I will show you, you will be seeing the exact video that I recorded when I was recording the audio. So the record player that you're going to be hearing that I used to record all of these discs with the exception of one of them, and I'll point that out later, is my uh, Audiotronics 312T, so 312T classroom record player. Uh, it's an all transistor record player, and it's actually one of the things that I like about it the most is that it is a school record player, so it actually has an additional rec record speed on it. It has an, a fourth speed. It has the standard 78, well, not standard, I guess, anymore, but it has 33, 45, 78, and it has 12 uh, RPM. So uh, the 12 RPM records were usually for long speeches or lectures that you would get in colleges and at schools, and then uh, that you could listen for quite a long time. I'm not sure exactly the capacity of each side of those records, but... Uh, so that's the record player that I use. That's what you're going to see when you're actually seeing the video of the records uh, spinning. That's the record player that I used. And all I did was take a very simple tip sleeve uh, audio cable and go right out of the headphone output of the record player into the back of my M box and recorded it right into Sony Vegas, uh, an older version of Sony Vegas that I have. Now, for the most part, all of the audio that you're going to hear has been doctored up by me a little bit. I took and added de-crackle, de-noise plugins. I did a little compression. I did a little bit of EQ. I did everything that was in my power to try to make every all of the recordings sound 
as good as possible. Now, that being said, these recordings are very old. I don't have the greatest record player. I don't have the greatest equipment. I don't have the greatest software. And a lot of these records are in pretty bad shape. So a lot of the recordings you're going to hear are very, very, very low fidelity, low quality. So I just want to point that out. Now, I try not to be super, super, super over. Tried, I try not to go super overboard with the denoising software. So it doesn't sound like it was it's just incredibly muffled. But I try to do as much as possible and take out as much of the noise, the crackle, the pops, the ksh as possible so that what we were left with was as true to possible as I could make it, uh, as true to the original source as possible. So um, I just wanted to, to say that. Uh, and I did actually render each of these songs, the audio output with with all of the effects on it to help make it as sound as good as possible and the raw files as well. And rather than go through and upload the videos with the raw uh, sound in there, which I'm pretty sure most people wouldn't want to hear that, they, you would probably much rather hear the fixed clean audio uh, after I went through and added all those effects to it. I just want to take a second here and I want to give you an example of what one of the recordings sounded like with the denoise and the decrackle on and without the denoise and the decrackle. So you're going to see a little bit of a clip here and I will clearly label on the clip what is denoised and decrackled and what is not. So listen to this. Uh, right on Buick and it's uh, guitar playing and singing. It says that I get it to my wife and it's slow and lonely. Slow and lonely. So there you can tell, of course, it is an enormous difference. I am pulling out so much of that and that that just happens to be in there. And it, depending on what you're using to listen to this video on, if you had good headphones or good speakers, you may have noticed tons more low frequency in there, which I did take out a lot of low frequency on everything. I have a low or I have a high pass filter on everything at about 80 Hertz. So anything that was uh, 80 Hertz and below for the most part is completely taken out uh, in every single section of this video uh, in all of the recordings. So I wanted to point that out as well. But again, a huge difference. And I'm not going to go through and show I'm not going to do any going back and forth because I think it's important to preserve the recordings as long as I can in the the same or at least in a consistent format if that makes sense a consistent quality so from here on out everything you're going to hear in this video is going to be with the denoise and decrackle and i did go through and denoise and or, or, well, the crackle stayed the same but the denoise i went through and did specifically change the settings of the denoise plugin to each individual uh, record and each side of each record as well. So I did try as hard as I could to make each thing sound as good as I could individually. So let's get into the records here. The first thing I want to talk about are these two recordio discs. And as I mentioned, uh, I have recorded uh, other videos on my channel a few years ago about recordio discs. So I'm not going to go into the whole history of these discs and what they are, but I am going to, but I do have other videos on my channel uh, where you can go through and look up if you want to hear the history of these uh, recordio discs, the years that they were made. I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly that a lot of them, we thought at the time that these discs, and these discs actually come from the same collection as the discs that I did a few years ago uh, on my channel in a video kind of similar to this. We are pretty sure that these discs were recorded at the Prague Radio Shop in Prague, Nebraska, USA. Uh, which there is no radio shop there. This was us finding out that there was a radio shop, so we had to talk to some people in town. But anyway, uh, from uh, Prague, Nebraska, between about, we think, 1948 to 1952. That's that's the years that we kind of narrowed everything down to. Uh, so the first one we're going to take a look at is, let's go ahead and do this big red one first. Now, this, I was really disappointed with this record for one reason, and that is that this side of the record, and again, I'll try to insert video here of the of the records that I recorded with a different camera where I could kind of control things a little bit better and, and actually focus on them. But uh, if you see this side of the record has, it's, it's a little dusty and it's a little cracked, but it actually played all the way through for the most part. There was one time I had to push the needle but you can actually see the grooves in here. And this is a, a complete recording. 
Whereas the other side, the recording is completely gone. All of the vinyl or lacquer or whatever this material is that was placed over the top of it and then recorded the grooves into is gone. There's just only a little piece here that remains. This little piece here is all that remains and there's no recording on it. And I obviously there'd be no way for me to listen to that. And the reason that's such a bummer for me is that uh, the side that this record was on is the song Cool Water, performed by Vern Bielik with the guitar and vocal. Uh, Vern is a guy that unfortunately passed away a few years ago. I'm not sure how many years ago, but he was someone that was very known for playing polka music and being just a sort of musician in the area that I grew up in, the sort of Bohemian Alps of Nebraska. And when we first started listening to these recordio discs a couple years ago in my other video on my channel, we were very surprised to hear a recording of him singing with piano. Most people didn't know that he played anything other than the accordion because he played that for so many years. But back in the late 40s, early 50s, he was doing other instruments as well. And so uh, the side of this record that that doesn't work was him doing the song Cool Water, which is actually one of my favorite Old West songs of all time, at least the version recorded by Marty Robbins. I absolutely love that song, and I would have loved to have heard Vern's version of this. And unfortunately, that's gone. And since these discs are one-of-a-kind discs, that recording is gone forever. As far as I know, there is no other recording made because uh, to record these discs, you literally just started the record player recording and then you held a microphone up and you sang or performed into it for the duration of the record. And since that's the process of how these records were made, uh, his recording of Cool Water is gone forever. There's no, no copy of this anywhere. So that's a huge bummer. But we do have the other side. And so this song is called Low and Lonely, again, by Vern Bielik playing uh, acoustic guitar and singing. And let's go ahead and listen to that right now. Uh, Vernon Bielik and his uh, guitar playing and singing. This is dedicated to my wife, and it's Low and Lonely. So with these recordings, one thing you're going to notice is that proximity to the microphone was a really big deal. And that actually goes for a lot of these other uh sort of types of records as well. And obviously anytime you're in front of a microphone, if I go like this, it sounds a little bit different than if I'm over here or if I was standing on the other side of the room. And since this was such a amateur way of recording something, uh, you can definitely tell at the beginning of that recording that Vern was standing a little bit further away from the microphone and wasn't necessarily maybe as comfortable with the process. But then as he gets going, 
I don't know if he moved closer, started to get louder, but you can definitely hear a little bit of like a proximity effect in terms of he sounds further away, gets a little closer. Um, also, you can obviously tell the sound quality of the recording is not very good. I took a lot of uh, of noise and clicks and pops and everything out of these records, and I tried to keep it as good as I tried to make it as good as I could in terms of the sound. Again, I'll just say that for all of the discs, but uh, you know, it is what it ended up being. So that is Low and Lonely by Vern Bielik. This is a really ex ex exciting one. I'm happy that we were able to get almost all the way through that. At the end, you'll notice I did have to kind of nudge the record along so we could get to it, but um, I'll be able to kind of edit that together uh, when I give uh, the recording the copy of this recording to the people who gave me these discs i'll be able to kind of stitch it together in such a way that hopefully you don't notice it as much but uh yeah that was pretty cool and this project started off on a really cool foot being able to hear that song i really enjoyed hearing Vern sing with an acoustic guitar rather than the accordion which as i said is what he's known for so now let's move on to uh, this smaller recordio disc. Now this only has one word written on it and it says Howard Johnson, I believe. And that was the name of the gentleman who ran the small radio uh, store in Prague, Nebraska back in the late 40s, early 50s, where they got one of these recordio uh, machines, record players slash recording machines in, and they would do sort of test discs for people when they would come in. It was a very novelty thing, if you could imagine. You were never able to record yourself before, so being able to have someone walk into the radio store, hit play, talk into a microphone, and then he could put the record on, play, put the record player on play mode instead of record, uh, put the needle on and start playing it, and you could hear a recording of yourself back. That had to be quite shocking to a lot of people, and I'm sure it was a big novelty at the time. And uh, these type of discs are so fragile, it's amazing that we still have any of these left. But uh, this one again says Howard Johnson. We know he was the guy that ran uh, the radio store back in the, like I said, late 40s, early 50s. And he uh, was... Uh, his voice was on some of the recordings in those other videos about Recordio Discs on my channel. This one was really awesome because it's so simple. It's just Howard speaking, singing, and it sounds like he's sort of testing the machine out. So a thing to pay attention to in this recording, again, is proximity. You can definitely tell when he moves farther and closer away from the microphone. And he's also trying out different voices, just having fun. So what we're going to do is we're going to listen to both side one. Well, there's really no side one, but we're going to listen to both sides of this record and see what you think of this. No. The second is rain, third come the roses that bloom in the lane. No need explaining, no one remaining, there's somebody I adore. I'm looking over a four-leaf clover that I overlooked before. Now I'm looking over a four-leaf clover that I overlooked before. One leaf is sunshine, the second is rain. Now through come the roses, baby. 
I'm looking over at far leaf clover that I overlook before. One leaf is sunshine, the second is rain. Yeah, third come the roses, they're blooming late. I'm looking over a four-leaf clover that I overlooked before. One leaf is sunshine, the second is rain. Third come the roses that bloom in the lane. No need explaining the one remaining is somebody I adore. I'm looking over a four-leaf clover that I overlooked before. <clears throat> There's a fall in the all Was prepared when Moe shot it for she shot it for. <clears throat> Reminiscing, I feel so beautiful, obvious to you. While I were coming, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going back to the southern land of the game. Skeeters am a hammer on the honeysuckle vine. Sleep can talk he bay. Drive those big brown eyes and whisper low. Ah, ay, 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 So again, to me, that is just so fun. It is a part of history of the tiny little town that I come from. I know I mentioned Prague, Nebraska, a tiny town right now with a population of about 270. Uh, all when I was growing up, we had a population of 346 people. Uh, I had a very small class, went to high school, kindergarten, all in the town of Prague, Nebraska. And so it's really fun for me to find something like this, uh, like these two recordio discs, and be able to take and preserve the audio information that was on these discs so that in the future we'll have them and it doesn't get lost because there could be piles of these discs sitting up in someone's attic. They don't know what it is and it ends up getting burned or thrown away, thrown in the trash, taken to the dump, whatever. And so I'm really happy that I was able to take these two discs, preserve the audio and now be able to share them with everybody on the internet. So it's really cool, really fun, really special. So let's move on from these to something that I was just shocked about. And so I tried to do a little bit of research on this disc. Um, I can't remember where I got this disc. Um, I have an uncle and a cousin who also collect rare audio things like this. We always buy all sorts of crazy records, different um you know, 45s, 78s, uh, all sorts of different vinyl things. I buy all sorts of CDs, all sorts of audio things. And so I'm not sure if this is something that I found, that my cousin found, or that my uncle found, and it sort of made its way to my house here so that I could eventually do this with it. But uh, this is something, it says, when you first look at this, it is shocking because this is metal. This is a metal disc. And when I was doing my looking my research online a little bit for this video, I'm pretty sure this is made of aluminum. Now I'm not too sure 
if if that's 100% accurate, though everything I could find online about uh, discs from about this time, uh, that they were recorded on, you could do home recordings on aluminum discs. And so I think that that's what this is. Now, I did a lot of uh, research online about how to play them, and you're supposed to be very careful. And I basically didn't wasn't really careful at all. I just put it on and I tried to record uh, record what I heard. And what you're going to hear is exactly uh, what I heard. So um, I know one thing you're not supposed to do is have much weight on the needle when it's playing this. You're supposed to have it set very light. Well, my record player, the, the Audiotronics that I was using, has a very light needle arm. And in some cases, I have to put a, a little extra weight on there so that it, it actually goes over some of those skips and some of those scratches on the record. But in this case, I think I think I was able to make it all the way through without putting anything else on it. You'll see in the video if I did or not, but um, just so that you're aware, uh, it's on both sides. It's very interesting. The metal is very cold to the touch and it's, it's pretty heavy. It's pretty hefty. Now, one other thing that's really awesome about this, and I'm so happy, even though she does say in the recording, I believe what uh, the date is, at least for one, one of the sides, uh, this says, it says right on on the sleeve here. This is great. This is why you write on stuff like this so you have tangible evidence. It says Amy Parker, October 23rd, 1939, reading the paper and reciting poetry. Okay? That's what we're going to listen to on side, I think side one or one of the sides. And then the other side is, uh, oh, hold on. That's Amy Parker. Now, the interesting thing about this is, it, on the other side here, it says Edna Clark, and then it says energy 240, 10 o'clock, intensity 61. I think you'll hear her say that this was for some sort of like an English reading club or a, re a class that they had, and she was required to record herself. So I think what Amy Parker was doing was she, that looks like a K, Amy Parker. I mean, I'm just assuming it's Amy Parker, but hmm, I'll take a, I'll show you a closer up view of that and you can see what you think. But I believe that Edna Clark on here was the person who maybe graded this and she gave her, uh, oh no, okay, hold on. Sorry, I'm, I'm a ding dong. It says Edna Clark, English 240 at 10 p.m. or 10 o'clock. And then it says intensity 61. So I'm not sure what that means. Maybe that's the intensity of the needle on the record. Um, I thought that she, it was Edna Clark giving her a grade and she gave her a grade of 240 for her energy and a grade of 61 for her intensity. But no, it's English 240. Uh, and it says 10 o'clock for whatever reason. Uh, maybe it's 10 minutes long, five minutes each side. Maybe that's what it could mean. And then it says intensity 61. So maybe that was a setting of the recorder. Now that I think about this, I should have thought about that a little bit more before I recorded this video, but hey, you're learning, I guess, as I am. So let's not, with any further ado, let's get into this and hear this aluminum record and what it sounds like uh, with Amy Parker reciting poetry and reading the paper, an article from a paper, it was a magazine actually, on October 23rd, 1939. This is my first voice recording in English 240, which meets every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I shall first read a short selection that I have had an opportunity to practice upon. It is taken from the editorial page of a recent issue of the Woman's Home Companion magazine. Cancer is a terrible disease, not only because it brings pain and death, but also because it inspires an immense amount of worry in a great many people who are never going to suffer from it physically. Much of this needless fear is among those who have had the disease in their family, for the belief has been that cancer can be inherited. Therefore, it is good news that recently came from the Institute of Cancer Research, after 12 years of experiment, in which 52,000 rats have been studied. It appears that cancer does not start unless some irritation is present. The liability to cancer as such is not carried in the germ cells which we inherit from our parents. As Dr. Francis Carter Wood puts it, this removes the fatalistic attitude. And it is that attitude which has deterred many persons from seeking the early examination and treatment which can so often check the growth of cancer and save lives. I shall now read a selection at sight of the Good Samaritan in College. 
A certain freshman went down from college, went down from home to college, and she fell on critics who said that she had no style, that her manners were awkward, and that she had an unattractive personality. Then they stripped her of her self-confidence, her enthusiasm, and her courage, and departed, leaving her hurt and lonely and half dead. And when the seniors saw it, they were amused, saying, what a good job the sophomores are doing when that freshman, and they passed by on the other side. In like manner, the juniors also, when they saw it, smiled and said, Yea, verily, for she had not the making of a good sorority girl, and they passed by on the other side. But a certain special student, as she went about, came where she was, and when she saw her, she was moved with compassion, and came to her and bound up her wounds, pouring in sympathy and understanding. And she took her to the room and set her on her feet again, and brought her unto her own circle and was a friend to her. Which of these, thinkest thou, proved neighbor to her the Solomon Christ? Go thou and do likewise. My name is Edna Fox. The date is October 23rd, 1939. My name is Edna Cross, and this is my second voice recording in English 240, which is from Mr. J.D. Hampton. The date is January 19, 1940. I shall read two poems. The first is The Conquered Hymn by Emerson. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to equal dreams unfurled. Here, once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world. The foe long since in silence swept. Alike the conqueror's silent sleep. In time, the ruined bridge has swept down the dark stream which seaward sea. On this green bank, by this soft stream, we set today a votive stone, that memories may there be redeemed, and like our sires, our sons are gone. Spirits that made those heroes dare to die and leave their children free, bid time and nature gently spare the shaft for they. To them can be. Next, the daffodils by Wordsworth. I wondered lonely of the cloud that floats on high or veils on hills, and all at once I saw cloud, a host of golden daffodils. Beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous with the stars that shine and twinkle on the mountain way, they stretched in never ending line along the margin of the day, ten thousand wide a glance, tossing their heads from sight the band. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves and breeze. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For all, and on my couch I lie in vacant or pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then, my heart with pleasure filled, and then, with the daffodils. So with this recording, you can tell, uh, again, proximity is a thing. You can definitely tell that she's a little bit more crisp and clear at the very beginning. And she kind of wavers a little bit in terms of, uh, the, I believe, distance from the microphone. Uh, but also on the second side, which hopefully I'll put it in the right order for you, basically in terms of the order that I recorded it. But on the second side, the second half, you started to hear a lot less lower quality from the record itself, more pops, um, more noise, and just uh, it wasn't necessarily the best quality. And so it, the quality definitely dipped the second half of the second side there. But I still think it's really fascinating to hear. It's a little bit hard to understand her in parts, but uh, trust me, it's significantly easier to understand her with the denoise and the declicking uh, rather than with all those things in there. But uh, kind of an interesting thing. I've never seen an aluminum record like this before, and I've had it here for a couple of years now. 
Uh, and so it was really fun to listen to this for the very first time. I knew that these are rather fragile and that you can't play them very much and that they also might damage record tips a little bit because it's a harder material. Uh, so I just wanted to go through and record it. I did this disc only. You Exactly what you saw is what I did. I believe just one side, then I flipped it over and recorded the other side. Uh, some of the other discs, I would do a bit of a recording, mess with a little bit, do another recording, mess with a little bit, and then say, okay, here's where I'm going to actually do it and do the full recording straight on which is what you're going to see in the video. But with this one, I was trying to be extra, extra careful, and I only did one recording of one side, one recording of the other side, and maybe trying to get a little bit of clarity in some places. But uh, yeah, so, so that's this. Now let's move on to uh, something that uh, was very special. This is something that my uncle gave me. This is something I've had here for years, and I specifically remember when he gave me this record. He gave it to me, and he said... You have to listen to this. It's a little, it's a girl reciting some story or something, but he said it's very emotional. You might want to have a box of Kleenexes handy when you're listening to it because you might cry. And so I'll pass that message on to you. Uh, in terms of what this actually is, this is awesome because we get a, um, we get a, another date on here. So that's really great. Now, one thing you'll notice, and I should have grabbed one of these. I wonder, do I have, a standard 78 here. I don't. Let me go grab one. I'll be right back. Hold on. So I went and got from my collection of 78s just a regular um, shellac 78. And if you're familiar with a 78 RPM records, you're probably familiar with uh, shellac. Almost all 78 RPM records are made out of shellac. They were made for a significantly longer period of time out of shellac than vinyl, and it was only at the very end of the lifespan of 78s that they started being made out of vinyl. Uh, and actually, I just learned this now. But anyway, this is an old uh, shellac vinyl record, and it's significantly heavier than this gem recording disc. And so one of the things that's really cool about this is that this is a vinyl 78 RPM record. And it starts uh, at the very, this, this sh uh, shellac 78 starts up here like most records and goes all the way down to sort of the inside. And then there's about this much space between the label and where the music ends. On this gem recording disc, the, the, there's no space. It goes from the very tip up here all the way down. And what happened in, the, in this instance with this recording, when you hear it is, it was someone giving a performance and the performance was um, quite long. And so they were trying to fit it all on this disc. Uh, but one other thing I will say is, like I said, the the weight of this disc is significantly more than the weight of this disc, which is how I know that this is vinyl. And so I started to try, I was trying to do a little bit of research on these gem, hold on, that's upside down for you. These gem, these gem recording discs. And it was very hard to type in gem vinyl record or gem records because apparently there are 150,000 record labels called gem records. And also everyone talks about finding a hidden gem at the record store. So it was very hard to find anything about this specific company to the point where I actually did not find a single bit of information specifically about the gem recording company or gem recording discs. However, I did find a few articles about um, recordings that were made during World War II. And I know that this was a popular thing because that was partly what recordio discs were used for in the very early creation of recordio discs. So during World War II and after World War II as well, but during World War II, uh, people would record messages for their uh, family members who were in the service and then send them overseas. And then if they had a recorder there, they would send a message back. And so you can imagine being, um, you know, a soldier uh, in a distant country and you get a package in the mail and it's filled with a few records and it's messages from your family, from your friends back home. That would have been a huge morale boost, I assume, to the troops at the time. And so I think these gem recording discs were one of the companies that were taking advantage of that technology at the time. And this specific disc says on it, Angel Wing by Arlene, and I think it says Shoemaker. So Arlene Shoemaker. Then it says Humphrey. Mid-state, and then it says something contest. 
And I don't know if it says like declare them. I'm not sure what that word is there. And then it looks like it says Howells. So Humphrey and Howells are both um, towns that are in Nebraska, not too far from here, within a 150 mile radius for sure. So I don't know if one of those things means that it was took place in that town or, or what. I have no clue. All I know is obviously what's on this label. But then the most important thing, it has the date, uh, March 13th, 1947. And so that was why um, I kind of figured that this was another clue in terms of the vinyl records, because in that article that I was talking about online, they were talking about how shellac records were so much more brittle and could break so much more easier if they were being sent, especially in the mail, especially across the sea, you know, especially with all these different things and packages for the troops. And so that was one of the reasons that they switched to using vinyl as a material to record everything onto. And then also the main driving factor into sort of pushing uh, vinyl being the main medium moving forward to record audio on for many, many, many years. So this it's kind of interesting to me and fun to note that this is probably one of the earliest recorded vinyl records, or at least in those first few years where they were first introducing vinyl as a recording medium rather than the shellac. And so that's really cool. And it was the military was using uh, vinyl records like this for several years before it started becoming sort of more of a mass produced thing available to the public. So, um, but again, this is 1947. So this is already several years, uh, you know, after World War II. But um, I think, I think, hey, Google, what was the year World War II ended? I thought it was 1945. World War II lasted from September 1st, 1939 to September 2nd, 1945. Yeah, that, that's what I thought. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, again, after World War II was already over. But something that's really fun and something that's, you know, pretty cool to have in my collection. You can see that it is uh, the same exact size as a shellac. It's actually a tiny, tiny bit bigger, but I would imagine that there's a lot of variance between even just shellac 45s. Um, but yeah, still a 40 or still 78 RPM, which is what I used to record it at. Every one of these discs was recorded at 78 RPM. And uh, oh, with the, the exception of the last disc we're going to talk about here, it was recorded and I recorded them back at 78 RPM. Uh, so let's go ahead and give this a listen. And remember what I said, this is a little bit of a touching emotional story. So you may want to have something, um, you know, you may want to have some Kleenexes handy uh, while you're listening to this. So again, this is Angel Wing being performed by Arlene Shoemaker. The sun was just setting as a tall boy in khaki stepped out of the old farmhouse. Just outside the door, he turned and put his arms around the bent shoulders of a very old lady who vainly tried to restrain her tears. No, no, Grandma, don't look so sad. You aren't going to let me see you cry, are you? No, come on, smile. That's a good girl. Goodbye. Take good care of Dad and Shep. Then he turned to the gray-haired man who stood silent in the background. Goodbye, Dad. Not yet, David. I'll walk with you to the gate. So arm in arm, they walked down the old path between the poplars. They did not speak until they reached the gate facing the highway. Then John laid an arm about David's shoulders. Son, before you go, I want to talk to you a little bit. Perhaps you've wondered why I've never told you much about your mother. Somehow, I just couldn't. Of course you know she died when you were born. Well, at first I thought I just couldn't go on. The years ahead seemed empty and useless to father. Never to see her again, never to hear her voice. I wanted to go with her, 
but I couldn't. You see, I had you. You needed me, so I stayed. I wanted to be more than just a father to you. I tried to take your mother's place a little. I was kind of a failure at that, but I tried. Dad, Dad, don't say that. You've been wonderful. You know how much you mean to me. Yes, Davy. I guess we have been closer than most fathers and sons. You have so much of your mother in you. I could never bear to punish you when you were small. You look up at me with your mother's eyes, and I couldn't. So I just loved you into being good. David, you're a fine boy, and I'm proud of you. And this is what I want you to remember as you leave me. Your mother loved all that was beautiful and good. She had high ideals and the courage to live up to them. Those traits must be immortalized in you. You have a priceless heritage, son. Guard it carefully. I will, Dad. Truly, I will. Goodbye, Dad. Goodbye, my boy. John watched until the tall figure disappeared into the dust. Then he turned back into the lane of poplars, a pain, sharply physical, filling the emptiness of his heart. A few weeks later, John came hurrying in from the mailbox, his face, joy his face joyously radiant. Grandma met him at the door. John, did you get a letter from Davy today? Yes, Mother, and listen to this. He's been selected to go to officer's training camp. Isn't that good news? Why, you don't say. My, that's splendid. But I'm not a bit surprised, John. Davy's a wonderful lad. Isn't it too bad his mother can't know? But maybe she does know. Yes, Mother. I like to think that she knows. Months passed. David's letters full of sparkling enthusiasm came regularly. He was now a second lieutenant, and he'd go overseas any day now. John read and reread his letters until they were so worn as to be almost illegible. Then he placed them in the trunk that held Alice's wedding gown and David's first little shoes. And then David was overseas. The letters came less regularly and the change in the happy, carefree boy was apparent in the closely written pages. John read them with an aching heart. After great One evening after reading David's letters, John arose and walked out under the poplars. He turned to the highway and walked up the hill to the burial ground following a worn path to a weather-stained tombstone. Leaning against the tomb, he said softly, Alice, I wanted to tell you, he's had another promotion. He's a captain now. We're proud of him, aren't we, honey? But I'm worried tonight, Alice. He's in danger. I know it. I feel it. That's what hurts so, Alice. He's in danger and I can't help him. I've always been able to stand between him and the hard knocks. But I'm helpless now. It's like I felt when you were in way, Alice. I wanted so to help you, to keep you. But you gave your life for him. And now he's out there fighting, perhaps giving his life that I might be safe. Alice. Remember that old song you used to sing about angel wings bearing you away? It's been running through my mind all day. I wonder if it means anything. Many miles away, David was speaking to his men. Listen, somebody has to get food to those men. They've been cut off in that dugout for three days. Why doesn't someone volunteer? Jenkins, will you go? Captain, I want to obey orders, but it would be suicidal to attempt to get to that dugout. We're too close to the enemy's lines. Yes, I suppose you're right, 
But those men, heavens how they must be tortured. Listen, Barnes, you take command. I'm going myself. The pack of food strapped to his back, David crawled out into the darkness. All was quiet, save for the distant roar of the guns. With cat-like stealth, he wormed his way along. A maze of barbed wire loomed in his path. He must cut his way through. Carefully, he reached out with the pliers. There was an echo of the taut wires that echoed far down the line, and an instant later, a flare of light shone into the sky, revealing David where he lay, prone upon the ground. His men saw it, heard the sharp crack of a gun. Then Corporal Jenkins resolutely spoke. They've got him. We were all cowards. We let him go. But I'm going out there to bring him back. Morning in the trenches. Corporal Jenkins bending over David saw his lips move. What is it, buddy? Somebody sing something. <coughs> Corporal Jenkins looked at the group of powder blackened faces around him. He he wants somebody to sing something. Does anybody know a song that would be all right to sing now? A moment's silence, and then a boy's voice came choking me from the shadows. Oh, come, angel band. Come and around me stand. Oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to fair world on high. Oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to mansions in the sky. As the voice died away, David's lips again moved. Angel wings, they're here, all around me, waiting to bear me away. I wish they'd go past the old farm. I'd like to tell Dad goodbye. Miles away, John was plowing the East Forty. A great peace was in his heart. All the worry and anxiety of the past month had suddenly vanished. Suddenly, David's old dog that followed at his heels gave a welcoming bark. Jeff, what is it? What do you see? Then softly, like the stirring of a breeze among flowers, John seemed to hear David, into 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 hear David. Suddenly, David's old dog that followed at his heels gave a welcoming bark. Jeff, what is it? What do you see? Then softly, like the stirring of a breeze among flowers, John seemed to hear David, and 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 to hear David. Suddenly, David's old dog that followed at his heels gave a welcoming bark. Jeff, what is it? What do you see? Then softly, like the stirring of a breeze among flowers, John came to hear David, and to hear David, and to hear David, and to hear David. So, you've just discovered... <laughs> One of the the uh, biggest setbacks of this medium, the story did not end. The recording ran out before the, re the story was completed. Oh, oh, when I was recording this, I was devastated. I was like, you have got to be kidding me. The story doesn't complete itself. It doesn't finish. And I went online right away and I tried to search for Angel Wing story, Angel Wing poetry, Angel Wing performance. And of course, all I got was 150 million performances of that stupid Angel Wing song that I hate. Uh, Eagle's wings, Eagle's wings, angel wings, all that stuff was popping up. There's it seems like throughout human history, there's been a lot of things called angel wing or angel wings. And so I actually was not able to find this story to hear how it ended. I would assume I assume based on the way it ended there with him basically saying that he could kind of hear David sit, David sit, David sit, David sit. 
I assumed that the story was very close to being finished at that point, and there was going to be some final, you know, some final sort of big crescendo to the story, very sad, and then applause. But because of the the limitations of this medium at the time, they recorded as much as they could, and then flipped it over, missed a few sentences while she was talking, recorded as much as they could, and they didn't get the entire thing on the recording. So that is absolutely crazy. It's devastating. I'm sorry I had to do that to you. I was going to warn you, but I thought, no, anybody watching this video deserves to be disappointed like I was. But remember, that's not the main you know thing that we should be focusing on. We should be focusing on the fact that that recording is now available to you to listen to. I'm very proud of the fact that that one sounded it's so good, so crisp, so clear. You could you could hear everything she was saying. Again, you could really hear proximity, but in this case, I think her proximity to the microphone was the same. Uh, you could hear a bit of reverb of the room. I believe she was standing on a stage. You can hear some people coughing in the audience. You can hear people in the audience moving around a little bit. But on a few occasions, she would turn and she would talk to uh, a person that was not necessarily, that was off to the side. So she would be talking and then she would turn and start talking over here and you could really tell a big difference when she did that. And so that's an interesting thing. It's kind of a bummer. You know, I wish that it would have been, um, it would have been recorded all perfectly and pristine, but uh, you know that's not how things were really done at the time. She didn't do it in a studio environment. It was a performance, and so you don't want to you know forsake the performance, uh, or you don't want to you don't want to um, you should never limit the performance because of the recording when you're in a performance setting like that, uh, a concert, something like that. If you're in a studio, you absolutely can do all sorts of things to make sure you're getting the correct the correct recording and the correct quality of audio and a very consistent quality, which is always very important when you're recording in a studio setting. But obviously in a performance setting like that, uh, it's all about the performance and not the recording. So, So that brings us to the last disc we have in this video. And this is something I've been wanting to try forever. And I have to say, I am a little bit ashamed of what I did, what you're going to see uh, in this video, because I did a little bit of research before I started recording this video. And that was all done after I had done the recording of this disc. So what I found with, I was so lucky about a year and a half ago at a garage sale, I bought a crate there was a fairly big sized crate, you know, like whatever, a foot and a half by foot and a half size crate filled with, I think there was 22 or so of these Edison diamond records. And these are the big thick ones that are almost a quarter of an inch thick. So comparing that to uh, 78 at the uh, 78, you can see here the difference in the width of those discs. Uh, this is an Edison Diamond record. They're very famous. Uh, they're known for being very amazing sounding if you have the correct player. However, I do not have the correct player. So the video you're going to see in a moment here is the recording that I took off of this disc using my Audiotronics regular needle, 78 RPM needle, I believe. Um, to try to pull off the track that's on this disc. Now the track that's on this disc, if I'm on the right side, this side, is the Star Spangled Banner. It says Star Spangled Banner, Francis Scott Key, Baritone and Chorus, Orchestra Accompaniment. It does not say who's performing or anything. It just says on here, Edison, uh, Thomas A. Edison, and then it's got like a little bit of a... Uh, that it's copyright protected or something, and then the very famous picture of Edison himself on the disc. But I read online that you're not supposed to use regular needles to play this, and you're especially not supposed to use Victrola needles because Victrola needle is basically just a giant metal needle that points down into the thing and, and can totally ruin the grooves of one of these Edison records. Uh, I did find out that the Edison records were made from about 1912 or so to about 1929. And I don't know when this recording was made. I have no clue. I did find right before I started doing the recording for this video that there is a website online. Let me see if I can find it where you can go and listen to over 3,500 of these Edison records that a university and the Edison estate 
went through and they they preserved the audio that was on all these records. I'll, let me see. It's called the uh, the Discography of America Historical Recordings. The D A H R. So. Uh, I, if you just search that, the Discography of American Historical Recordings, uh, it's from the UC San, University of California Santa Barbara Library, but it's in partner with Humanities and Packard Humanities Institute. Um, and apparently they have like a huge uh, library on here of these Edison discs that you can listen to. I, I just was surfing the site very basically. So I know I'm being a little, uh, I feel like I'm being a little bit uh, higgledy piggledy here with my thoughts, but I wanted to make sure I remember to mention that. But so Edison discs like this were recorded vertically as opposed to horizontally, horizontally like all Victrola discs and other all other records at the time were being made. So because they were recorded like this, they're basically completely different than other records of the same time. And everything I was reading online is that if you have the correct machine, an actual Edison machine, an Edison record player, uh, it's supposedly fantastic quality. Some of the best quality records that were ever made. And um, I'm so bummed to find out that all of the Edison records I have, I'll probably never be able to hear uh, because I will never find or have an Edison disc player. So if anyone out there that's watching this video knows about this format a little bit more and wants to let me know if there's any way that I could retrofit uh, any of my record players or anything like that with some sort of a needle that would play these, I would love to know that. Uh, but I can't imagine that that would be something that any company is making nowadays for modern record players because uh, these are such niche things that at this point are, are close to being 100 years old, if not significant, you know, 110 years old at this point. Um, but I know that, uh, because they're recorded vertically and because they're recorded differently, they have a special diamond needle on all Edison record players, and you're not supposed to use any other record player to play it. And if you do, it's significantly less volume and it can severely damage the record. And so what you're going to see in a second here is you're going to basically see me playing this record all the way through, trying to hear as much of the Star Spangled Banner as possible. This is probably the lowest quality recording of anything you're going to hear in this video, and it's it sounds really bad. So let's go ahead and listen to that, and then I'll come back before we do one more special thing with this record.
Okay, so now that you've heard that, recorded the same way everything else you've heard in this video, uh, just with the output headphone output of my Audiotronics record player into the input of my Mbox, um, I I really wish I would have known not to do this at the time. Although I will say, looking at the record, it doesn't look damaged in any way. However, I trust everything that was said on the internet, and I probably did damage the record a little bit. I thought that because this was a significantly old record that I could maybe put it in my Victrola and that it would sound better. And so I just took a microphone and I set it up right in front of the uh, cabinet. You'll see in the video here in a second that I opened the cabinet doors and I cranked my Victrola and I listened to this entire record, uh, the, at least the one side of it, the Star Spangled Banner, on my Victrola. And it's specifically said online that you're not supposed to play these on Victrola record players because the needle will just grind right into the grooves of the record and can definitely ruin it. So hopefully I didn't ruin it too bad. I think it's really cool because it is the Star Spangled Banner, obviously a very important song <laughs> to the history of our country and the history of basically all of recorded music. And I don't know what the earliest recorded version of the Star Spangled Banner is. And one interesting to note of this that you heard there was there is actually additional music and a, a second verse or something, like an additional verse that sounded almost like it was in German or a different language. Uh, and then the chorus came in at the very end and it ended the way we're kind of familiar with the, the Star Spangled Banner ending. But there was more to the song, which I've never heard in a recording before. And I don't know. Like I said, I'm, a sh I'm sure there were recordings of the Star Spangled Banner made before this. The Star Spangled Banner was probably one of the very first songs ever recorded. But this has to be one of the earliest recordings of the Star Spangled Banner. You know, possibly in the top 50 times that song was ever recorded, which is amazing if you think about the fact that it's probably been recorded, you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of times at this point. So that was why I grabbed this specific Edison record. And it's also, it's not one of my Edison records that's in like mint condition. However, I do want you to see this video of me playing it on the Victrola. So let's go ahead and listen to that now. And you can see how my Victrola did uh, with this record. It actually sounded a little bit more clear, but man, did it get distorted and stuff in the moments where they were being a little bit more dynamic with their performance.
Okay, so there you have it, my <laughs> messing around with the Victrola. And then I actually did a little bit more because I wanted to demonstrate for people who are unfamiliar with how Victrolas work, how you adjust the volume of the Victrola. So I actually played this record multiple times, just putting the needle in the middle. So let's just look at that real quick and you can see how the volume uh, operates on an old Victrola player like the one I have. Okay, so I know I wasn't supposed to use uh, the Victrola needle, the Victrola record player on these records. You live and you learn, and I hopefully this video teaches someone that if they have some of these records, do not play it on any sort of a player that doesn't have a special needle specifically for these records uh, or an original sort of Edison record player. So something to keep in mind, like I said, you live and you learn. So that's all the records that we have for this video. I hope it was sort of entertaining for everybody. Um, I know it was very fun for me to do things like this. Uh, like I said, the historical aspect of this is one of the things that I think is sort of the most special. And uh, it's one of the things that I cherish, like I said, knowing that problem for sure, these are the only two copies of this in existence. So now you hearing this, you're the first people ever to hear uh, the, these recordings. And the same could probably be said for both of these recordings as well. Uh, it's possible that this gem recording was maybe copied onto other records, though I doubt it. And I, everything I found out online about these aluminum discs is that even still to this day, masters are pressed onto aluminum discs. But for something that's this old, I would assume that this was just recorded on some sort of a machine that they had and then sent to whoever was supposed to get it somehow, maybe grade it, I don't know. Um, but basically what I'm saying is we got some really special, unique things here that are one of a kind things. And I'm so happy that I get to share them with everybody out in the universe. If you're an audio person like me, you're interested in stuff like this, let me know in the comments uh, down below something cool you've come across. Uh, if you know anything more about these different records, as I said, I do know a lot more about the Recordio discs. Check out my other videos on my channel from about two years ago uh, discussing these. I have a really long video just like this video a really long video sort of discussing and then showing each of the different Recordio discs. But I go into detail about the history of the Wilcox, Wilcox Gay Company that manufactured these discs and sort of like how they were made and all those things. So if you want to learn more about these discs specifically, go check that video out on my channel. But I don't know that much about these aluminum discs. I couldn't find anything out about these gem discs. And I'm always interested in these Edison discs because I have so much of them, so many of them, and they're in pristine condition. But now 
now that I know I'll probably never be able to hear them unless I come across a machine, uh, I feel like I'm a little bummed. However, that website that I mentioned may have already all of the records that I own already digitized and uh, ready to be listened to for free on the internet. And that's what's kind of cool about a lot of this stuff as well. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know anything that you thought about the video or whatever. And um, like I would tell you to subscribe to my channel, but you're probably not going to get much content like this. Uh, mostly, like I said, I do reaction videos to new albums and things. And I'm very excited because just tomorrow I'm going to record my first reaction of the year, listening to the brand new ARCS album. We've also got new Depeche Mode, new Metallica, new In Flames coming next month. We've got all sorts of awesome stuff. That's what I'm going to be doing on my channel here. So if that sounds interesting to you, uh, feel free to subscribe, like this video, whatever. Do whatever you want to do. Thank you very much for watching. And if I ever do something like this again in the future, I hope to see you uh, then.